Eight life-changing tips in Adobe Premiere Pro. These tips range from absolute beginners who have never opened the software to professionals who use it every day. But first, I want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in for the launch of Shut Up and Cut in just a couple of days. We ride. So keep an eye out. But here are the top eight tips that I think are absolutely necessary for everyone who uses Adobe Premiere Pro. Starting with the remix tool. Everybody knows that music is a huge part of any edit. Music is the biggest emotional pull into any video, so it's vital that you use music correctly. Unfortunately, music can also be horrible to edit, especially when your track doesn't fit perfectly with your edit, needing to cut pieces of the track and trim them up so it matches the length of your edit. So it's tough and kind of time consuming, but Adobe has helped us out with the remix tool. The remix tool takes any music track and automatically remixes it to a certain length and it does it seamlessly. Let's say your edit is only 30 seconds long, but the song you want to use is three minutes. The remix tool allows you to shorten that three minute song down to that 30 second edit. Premiere automatically scans and stitches and cuts that song down to 30 seconds, keeping the rhythm and pacing of the song as best as it can. This literally saves hours of stitching the songs and parts together. And the quality at which it does this is absolutely insane. This is by far one of my favorite things about Premiere. If you wanna do this for yourself, go to your toolbar and click and hold the ripple edit tool to open up a menu of different tools. Then select your remix tool. Come over to your music track on your timeline, select the edges of the song and drag these edges where you want it to match up with your edit. Premiere will do some dancing and it will automatically adjust the song to match whatever length you trim it to. Now I do have a couple of objections. This tool is fairly new and was released in early 2022 so you can expect some lagging when you use this tool but make sure you're up to date with Adobe Premiere if you want to use it. The other thing I'll say is that as an editor you really should be able to mix music without this tool anyway. At the end of the day your music depends on your cut and you're gonna have to make that music match your cut and the mix tool doesn't read your cuts in the timeline meaning it does not refer to your actual edit in the video tracks when mixing your song. So you really should be able to make your own cuts and find the beats for whatever song that you're working with. Relying on a tool to do this for you, I wouldn't recommend. I find that this tool is most effective when you already know how to mix music in your software or if you're using this tool on temporary tracks. So keep that in mind. Moving on to tip number two, have a congruent folder structure throughout your project. If you've ever had to scour your computer for video files, music, or even pictures, you know that it can genuinely ruin the video editing experience. Not only that, but the same thing can happen inside of your software. You lose track of where all of your assets are, and you're constantly scrolling through trying to find stuff by clicking and opening every file. Point is, is when you're unorganized, it wastes a lot of time. And having a folder and bin structure completely eliminates all of that. If you don't know what a folder structure is, a folder structure is a way of organizing data for your project. A binge structure is the exact same thing, but it's inside of your software. For example, my folder structure looks like this. I have a footage folder that contains all of my video files, an audio folder that contains all of my audio files, and an assets folder that contains all of my graphics, titles, or any third-party file that I use. And I have a music folder that houses all of my music. And anytime I get a new piece of data, I put it in its corresponding folder. This is how I organize and structure all of my data so I know where to go when I'm looking for something. If I need a video, I know to look in the video folder. If I need audio, I know to look in the audio folder. It saves me a lot of time. But what's going to save you even more time is having a congruent binge structure inside of your software. So my binge structure will look just like my folder structure. So after I have all my data in my folder structure, I recreate these folders using bins inside of Premiere. The easiest way to do this is to drag and drop these folders into your project panel. This is going to import all of those folders and all of the media that was inside of those folders. Now all of your media and folders are congruent and all of the same data that is in your folders is now in the same bins in your software. This is going to make your life so much easier when trying to organize, locate, import, or even create new files. Now your folder structures do not have to be congruent, but it is going to be a huge time saver if you can comprehend what is what in and out of your software. Because when you know where all of your data is, where it's going and where it's supposed to be, you waste less time organizing and spend more time actually editing. And at the end of the day, that's what I really want. Moving on to tip number three, the blurry background when editing vertical clips. How many times have you cut a video that cuts from a horizontal video to a vertical video? It's very obvious when you go from a 16 by nine to a nine by 16 shot, and it takes the audience out. That's something you don't want to do. I'm sure you've tried scaling up your nine by 16 shot, but then it cuts everything you want out of the frame if you didn't frame for it. And I'm sure you've even tried putting more than one vertical video in the same frame just to fill it. But more often than not, cutting from no black bars to black bars is a nasty cut, and it's very noticeable. But sometimes you have to do it because that's all the 
footage you have. And we're starting to see vertical video a lot more, so the ability to seamlessly blend vertical and horizontal video is a must as an editor. So here's my solution, and you've probably seen this solution before, but when all else fails, I always rely on a blurry background. I take my vertical video, duplicate it, place one above the other on the timeline, and on the bottom one, I scale it up until it fits the frame. Then I go to my effects panel and type in Gaussian Blur. Then I drag and drop this effect onto the bottom clip. Then I put that blur around 25 to 50. Your frame is now filled, and cutting to that clip is a little less noticeable because it simultaneously fills the frame and directs the viewer's attention to where they need to look. Now, you can be as creative as you want here. In 80% of the time, just this will do the trick. But sometimes I like to add a drop shadow to the top video to separate it even more from the background. Sometimes I'll even keyframe the positioning of the bottom clip so it moves ever so slightly in the background and gives a more dynamic feel to it. Feel free to steal this trick because I, that's what I did. Tip number four, adjustment layers. Use them. Trust me, use them. But what is it? Think of an adjustment layer as a piece of glass that you place above your video clips. So when you're watching your video, you're viewing it through this piece of glass. And so when you apply effects on this piece of glass, you see it affecting the clip in your program monitor. In reality, it's not really affecting the clip. It's just affecting that piece of glass. That's what adjustment layer does. It gives you greater control and flexibility over your edits rather than just doing direct adjustments. They also give you options. The option to add visual, transitional, or animated effects to a single clip or multiple clips at a time. Adjustment layers give you more than one way to do any one thing inside of Premiere. They can save you time, they can improve your workflow, and you should use them. If you want to create an adjustment layer, go to your project panel, right click, go to new item, and select adjustment layer. Your adjustment layer will spawn in your project panel. And all you have to do is drag and drop it onto your timeline. Then you can extend it or shorten it to any length. A common practice I use with adjustment layers is to transition from one clip to the next. For example, I have preset transitions that I use, and if I place my adjustment layer over the edit point between those clips, I can drag and drop my transitions onto the adjustment layer in the transition will affect everything under the adjustment layer without touching the actual clip. Another common practice is to use the adjustment layer to color multiple clips at once. I would drag it over my entire timeline, add a Lumetri effect to it, and color it while I see the adjustment happening. This is a great way to speed up your workflow. Now, there are some times when you wouldn't want to use an adjustment layer. For example, let's say you finished your edit and your edit has multiple shots from different locations, and now you want to color the footage. Well, if you have different shots from different locations, the color adjustments that you're going to make are going to be different. So instead of doing one whole adjustment layer, you're going to have to cut the adjustment layer up, and this can get confusing really quick. And in that case, I would just color using something else, which is tip number five, source editing. Editing on a clip's source location. A lot of people miss this one because it does take a deep understanding of your software to even realize that you can do this in the first place. This is going to take some explaining. Every single clip that you import into Adobe Premiere has a source. For example, let's say you have one long take in Premiere. Let's call this one long clip your parent clip. And if you cut this parent clip up into a bunch of smaller clips, these become child clips. And all of these child clips come from the one parent clip. If I select any of these child clips and go to my effects controls panel, you will see at the top I have two locations for this child clip. I have the actual child clip that is in the sequence, and I have the source of that child clip in the sequence. And the source location is shared between all of the other child clips in that sequence. So if I make a color adjustment in this location, then all of the other child clips will then have those same color adjustments. If I make a color adjustment in this location, only that single child clip will have that adjustment. So why is this helpful? With this technique, you only have to color one clip and it will affect the rest of those clips with the same source. Now you don't have to make a bunch of adjustment layers or copy and paste color effects to different clips. It's pretty baller. Doing this saves you a bunch of time. It's very helpful when coloring shots that have the same lighting. This is a great technique for cutting things like interviews, talking heads, and you can do more than just color the source location. You can add static effects like Gaussian blur or some denoiser. I use this tip all the time, especially when editing my TikToks or videos like this, because all of the lighting between all the shots is exactly the same. It doesn't change between shots or cuts, and that's when this tip is most useful. But moving on, tip number six, proxies. If you've ever lagged, skipped frames, or even crashed inside of your software because your footage is too big, proxies are going to help you. Sometimes your computer isn't powerful enough to ingest that raw footage. This is what causes your system to lag or slow down. This might happen when editing anything above 2K footage. A lot of people will try to lower their playback resolution when this happens, which in some cases will help, but depending on your system specs, it may not. That's when you should create a proxy version of that clip. Proxies take your high-resolution footage and creates a lower-resolution version of that same footage. 
footage. To do this, you need to select your clip in the project panel, right click it and go to proxy. Then click create proxy. This window is going to pop up 99% of the time. The default settings are going to be what you want to use, but under preset, you just want to make sure that you have low resolution proxy selected, then click OK. Premiere will set up your queue in Adobe Media Encoder and Adobe Media Encoder is then going to create your proxy version and attach it to the clip inside of Premiere. After Media Encoder is done, you have to activate the proxy in Premiere. To do this, go to your program monitor and at the bottom right hand corner of your program monitor, you'll see this plus button. This is your button editor. Click this and look for this icon. This is your toggle proxy icon. Drag and drop it into the toolbar at the bottom of your project panel, then click it. This is going to activate any and all proxy versions of your clips in this project only. This is going to make your system work way less and it will take away a lot of the lagging and skipping. If you are still lagging or skipping, then this is when I would come over here to the playback resolution and drop it down as low as you can. Now Adobe Media Encoder creates a whole new video file for that proxy. So if you have very long clips that are hours long, you will need to make sure you have enough storage, but this is definitely worth it if you want a smooth workflow inside of Adobe Premiere. So try it out. Let me know what you think. Moving on to tip number seven, which is exporting an Adobe Media Encoder and then editing in Premiere at the same time. If I'm editing more than two projects at once, I can export one project in Adobe Media Encoder while editing the other in Adobe Premiere. But you can only do this if you have the specs for it. What this does is it allows me to get a lot more work done in a shorter amount of time. Usually you have to wait until your project is done exporting before you can work on another Premiere Pro project. For example, if you finish a project and export it in Premiere, you cannot use Adobe Premiere until that project is finished exporting. By exporting an Adobe Media Encoder, which is completely separate and apart software, you can edit your project while you are exporting. This comes in handy, especially when working with tight deadlines. To export your project in Adobe Media Encoder, all you have to do is go through your normal export routine, but instead of clicking export, click Q. Premiere will tell Adobe Media Encoder to take this project. Once it's opened up in Adobe Media Encoder, all you have to do is hit the green arrow up here and then Media Encoder will start rendering it immediately. And if you have a second project you could be working on, you can open that up in Premiere and start cutting. A word of caution, this is tip is for those who have spent the money and have highly specced out systems. For example, I have an iMac with 64 gigs of RAM and a 10 core i9 processor, but it can handle rendering in AME and handle the editing in Premiere. A lot of lower end systems won't be able to handle this kind of workload. But if this is something you want to do, I would highly recommend upgrading your RAM, CPU, and GPU processors. It is going to be expensive, but it is definitely worth it if this is something you want to do. So moving on to tip number eight, shift D. Now, this tip I'm about to give you is going to sound so simple, stupid, but it's going to be one of the biggest time savers and quality enhancers of your work. Like, it's a double dinger. Less time, but higher quality. And it's Shift D. When you cut from one piece of audio to the next, you can literally hear the blips from the next piece of audio that's starting. This stands out a lot and is a disruption in the viewing experience. This is the last thing you want when people watch your video. You want them to stay focused. What I would do to fix this was go to my effects panel, go to audio transitions and drag and drop a crossfade onto the edit point between my clips. This would dissolve that blip sound and make a cut from one audio clip to the next very smooth. And I would do this for all of them. Yes, this fixes the blip, but it's so slow when having to do this for every single clip. You can do it way faster. Instead of dragging and dropping a cross dissolve onto all of your clips, select all of your clips and hit Shift D. Every single cut point on every single audio clip will be dissolved and you would have saved so much time in doing so. Every single project I work on, I wait until the very end to do this because it's literally so satisfying to see all of the cross dissolves get put on at once. And it's so beautiful. It's like the ninth wonder of the world. I forget how many we have now, but if you want before you do this, you can change the duration length of the actual transition by going up to your Premiere Pro menu, going to preferences, and then going to timeline at the top, you'll see audio transition default duration. You can measure this in either frames or seconds, and you can choose how long you want your transitions to be. What I like to do is keep it under half a second, especially when applying crossfades to dialogue clips, because sometimes you may hear dialogue from one audio clip before or after another. So it's best to keep the duration as low as possible so it fades out before the next piece of dialogue comes in. I know this tip sounds so minuscule in the grand scheme 
scheme of things, but it's the little habits that we have as editors that matter. And all of those little habits add up. And it's literally the difference between good and great. And that's one of my goals with Shut Up and Cut is to show you how to utilize video editing to get your videos from good to great. And these tips are just the beginning and they've done wonders for me. So hopefully you were able to pull something out of this video. And if you didn't, well, thanks for watching. Unfortunately, this is the last video being released before the official Shut Up and Cut launch day. And on that day, we are launching with a free one hour training that breaks down all the aspects of editing from the type of hardware you need to the workflow and the software, all the way to getting your first gig as an editor. It is the single most lean and dense piece of post-production information I have ever seen. And it's completely free. But it's all for the launch of Shut Up and Cut, an online film school for editors. There are only 500 spots available on launch day. So if you want, you can sign up for it by hitting the link in the description of this video. It's coming out in just a couple of days. I can't wait to share it with you, but thank you for following along. And with that said, I will see you in the next one.